So uh, let's start from there. <laughs> what do you do? So thank you. Um, so I spent the last 25 years as a CPA, the last 11 running my own business, helping small business owners uh, with their cash flow and their taxes. But so often the phone would ring with people looking for help and I couldn't help everybody. I only had so many hours. I had to keep my prices at a certain point because I had a team of people to pay. And there were so many people who turned to Google for tax or mm. financial advice. It just broke my heart. And so this year, my goal has been to carve out time to educate and to help people find answers about their money and about taxes from an expert and not have to rely on Google or their buddies on the golf course to mm. get those answers. And how can people reach out to you? I have a website, wendybarlin.com. There's all sorts of things there. There's free resources, lots of free downloads with tax tips and worksheets. Um, there's some webinars that you can pay for and listen to. And then we've just started opening up an eight-week uh, tax program for DIYers, people who don't want to hire an accountant but want to learn how to maximize their own tax deduction. So we've got a large range of things from free downloads to the eight-week course, which is for those people who really want to dive deeper. Okay. And uh, do you want to share the pricing details and all? Right. So again, from free <laughs> all the way up to $8,000 for the okay. eight-week course. Um, and periodically, as we get close to filling those courses, we do offer discounts. To, we do 10 people in a group so mm -hmm. that it's very personal and I can answer a lot of those questions. So look out in your email for um, discount codes on that. Okay. And then last question on this one. Uh, on your website, I did not notice a LinkedIn or Twitter accounts and all. So I, are you planning? Yeah, I'm not a tweeter. I'm not a tweeter, <laughs> but I am a LinkedIn person. And thank you for letting me know. I'll have my web team add the okay. LinkedIn okay. address, but I'm definitely active on LinkedIn. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me there. Okay. Thank you for all those details. So let's uh, dive into our interview section. What you wanted to become when you was in high school? Well, I think it's even earlier than high school, honestly. When I was a little girl, um, I wanted to be a princess. I wanted to be whisked away by a prince on a white horse. But I think by the time I got to high school, I realized there was no prince coming. And I grew up in a very traditional South African home where my mother didn't work. And I watched her having to ask my dad for money. And anytime she wanted to buy something, she had to ask him first. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm, this is not going to be me. If the prince on the white horse isn't coming, then I'm going to take control of my own money. And so I went to school and got an accounting degree, not because I wanted to be an accountant, but because I wanted to always be able to provide myself, provide for myself mm -hmm. and provide for my children and never have to ask someone else or be reliant on someone else for money. And to this day, that gives me a great sense of pride and a great sense of security. You knew very early that what you wanted to become. I did. I think most of us did, right? Although I do have a lot of friends who in their 40s kind of jumped to a second career. But I think most of the time it's only because the first career was something that we either felt um, socially appropriate to do or we were pushed into, right? And then as you mature, you realize, hmm. So when I started doing accounting, it was very traditional. It was hourly billing, it was mm. auditing, it was accounting. And here I am 25 years later, we never charge by the hour. And we do things very differently than I learned to do 25 years ago. So even within any one profession, there are a lot of different ways to make it work for you. Okay, so moving from your college accounting degree, so how your career started and, and how did you, what all happened? Well, after college, I was in South Africa, and it was not a safe place to be in the mid-90s. Uh, there was a lot of turbulence in terms of politics and socially, and it was a scary place to be starting a career. So I packed a bag, and I went backpacking around the world for a year. And oh, wow. it was the most amazing experience. I had no money. I was staying in youth hostel. 
Um, and one of my stops was Los Angeles, California. And I just fell in love with not to love this gorgeous city with all kinds of opportunities for entrepreneurs, for people who are excited about business. Mm -hmm. um, and I never left. I found a job and I rented a, an apartment. I didn't know anyone. I found an apartment. I got a car and I never left. And then I just went from job to job to job until the towers fell in New York. And that was when I realized I don't want a job. I want to do something for myself. This is my opportunity. So I quit my nice big six-figure job and went out on my own. <laughs> and as many people on the call know, that is an adventure in and of itself um, with many highs and many lows. Mm -hmm. But here I am today um, with a seven-figure business that I've worked very, very hard to build, but that I love. And you're providing a um, career to many other people too, not just... Around the world. We yeah. have a team around the world, yeah. Awesome. So uh, I want to ask you a question. So you was in South Africa. You decided to go travel around the world. I have many questions. There. <laughs> uh, Number one, what all countries did you go? Uh, so the way the air ticket worked was that I had to keep traveling in one direction. So I started in Australia and okay. I went down to New Zealand and then I came over to the US and I traveled uh, 26 American states on a Greyhound bus and then I went up to Canada. Then I went over and did Western Europe. And because I'd been kind of looking for work in California while I was here, uh, the timing was such that a job came through and the paperwork came through for me to come back to the States mm -hmm. once I was in Western Europe. So I never got to Eastern Europe. Um, I got as far as Austria and Germany, and then I flew back to the U.S. because there was this job waiting for me and I didn't want to give mm -hmm. up that opportunity. So that was the end of my travel. But I was gone about nine months. And let me tell you, you get very sick of your clothes <laughs> when you look out of a suitcase for nine months. So my last stop before I came to California was in London. And I left most of my clothes behind. I will never forget just leaving it all and saying, I never want to see these tennis shoes again. <laughs> they were a companion for nine months. That's it. That's it. But I met the most amazing people. And, you know, here I am 25 years later, and I'm still in touch with people that I met on the road, just other travelers. And do you ever, uh, do you ever think about finishing that travel that you had in mind? So East Europe and any other country that you have not touched at that time? Well, you know, it's very different traveling when you're 25 than when you're 45. <laughs> um, so the idea now of staying at a youth hostel is very different. I do still travel, but now I have children and I have a lot more responsibility. So I do travel as much as I can, but it's not the same. There's something very freeing about traveling when you're young and you have no responsibilities other than a backpack of dirty clothes to take care of. Um, so I really recommend for anybody that has the opportunity to do that. Because once you start building a business and you have a mortgage and you have children, all of a sudden, the thought of yeah. fear and what could happen change the things that you choose to do every day, you know? But you went to this adventure expedition. What were your parents? Um, they did not resist for this. That's a great question. So now that I am a parent, I cannot believe they let me do it. Yeah, um, I have a little yeah. year old. <laughs> My parents, yes, they wanted me to go because they knew that the future in South Africa was uncertain and they were worried for my safety. And so they, they definitely supported me going. It was hard for them because there were no cell phones. Mm -hmm. We had to communicate by a fax machine. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was no email back then, right. so it was very, very hard for them, but I certainly appreciate it. And now as a parent, I cannot imagine putting my 21-year-old daughter on a plane and saying, good luck, be careful. Oh, they, they definitely have courage and support for you and trust for you. Um, 
which is what kind of made you who you are now. Right. Most likely, most likely. But, you know, the DNA is the DNA. My sister is very different. She would never have done that. And um, she went straight from home to college to get married. And so mm-hmm. some of it is just who we are, right? It's who just our DNA. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I see that in business owners, people who have the courage or the crazy to quit their job and truly believe in mm-hmm. what it is they're going to do. Um, those are people we find each other. True. Very true. You are the one who, who defined your destiny, not anyone else. So I, I agree. Yeah. It's just interesting to me, right? Because when you look, I'm sure you have the same. There's people in your family who are so different from you. And I, yeah. Like, how can I be related to these people? <laughs> <laughs> so when when you went to Australia, mm-hmm. um, that was your first destination, and uh, you're in a plane, you're going there, you don't know anybody. Well, I did have some family in Australia, so that okay. was a bit of a softer landing. My okay. best friend from high school lived there. And uh, I did have some family there. That was a good place to start. Okay, so you you reached there. Did you live with them or you you find, I mean, how did you start there uh, living? Right, there? so I stayed with them, but you don't want to stay with anybody for too long, right? right, right, right. <laughs> You're not welcome in someone's house for too long. So I stayed for uh, probably a week and then <laughs> I would find a youth hostel. And, you know, people think of youth hostels. I don't know what people think of youth hostels, but I was, kind of nervous going to a youth hostel, but the truth is they were the most amazing places where Mm -hmm. I met other people from around the world. And it was much, much safer than I imagined. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you probably wouldn't leave your money out on the bed while you took a shower. You had to be cautious, but I never was nervous that something Mm -hmm. would happen to me. And so I would generally find a youth hostel. Um, I used travel books. There were books like Lonely Planet, was the yeah. brand of book that I used and I would buy the local travel Lonely Planet and it would say these are the areas to go, these are the places to stay, these are the things to do and, and that was really my guide um, and that allowed me to do the research because there was no internet or cell phones or Google back then. And then you found I guess job and you started well, I didn't work because you have to have a visa to work in those places. So okay. I was just living off the small amount of money that I had with me. Um, and so okay. I had you know, I had taken some cash with me, some of my savings, and okay. that's what I was living on. So, yeah, it was bread and milk with a pretty good meal. <laughs> okay. And then uh, at some point you decided to go to the next destination, New Zealand. Which was down in New Zealand. What an amazing experience. I've since been back several times and just the most amazing place. Did you know anyone there before you nope. went? No. Nope. Okay. Nope. So how did you decide where in this huge New Zealand, where you're going to go and how, where you will live? So again, I got the Lonely Planet guide and I kind okay. of looked through it and, and said, well, I'd like to travel as much of the country as I can. What are the things that I'd like to do? What are the things that I'd like to see? Uh, And sometimes things surprised me. Like one day I got on the wrong bus. So I signed up for a tour company that said they were going to take us to look at the mountains. So I show up where they say you'll pick you up and a little white bus arrives, a minivan. And I hop in, I sit down Mm -hmm. and I say hello to the guide. I sit down. The next thing I know they're pulling up at what looks like glaciers, ice mountains. And the guy says, everybody out, we're going to climb the glaciers. And I said, no, 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 that's <laughs> not what I signed up for. Turns out I was on the wrong bus, okay. but I had no choice because the bus was leaving and there was nowhere for me to stay. I had to climb this glacier. And I said, I can't. I'm not fit enough. I'm not strong enough. I have asthma, right. every excuse you can imagine. And the guy said to me, here are your poles, here are your ice shoes, let's go. <laughs> and it was one of those moments that was so memorable. What a fantastic experience to climb this glacier. And I would never, ever have chosen 
to do such a thing. But the world intervened. Mm -hmm. And so I had a lot of those experiences along the way where, you know, call it destiny, call it, call it the universe intervened. And I had experiences that I wasn't planning on, um, but they were memorable. <laughs> How? How long was that? Uh, I mean, how long is in how tall that mountain or how long? How you know, many hours? I don't remember how tall it is, but it just felt like forever. And there were places where you had to kind of climb through a hole in the ice. And I thought, I'm going to be like Winnie the Pooh and get stuck in this hole and someone's going to have to pull me out. Um, but I made it. And, you know, it just makes you stronger. All the things we think we can't do. Mm -hmm. And so now I... 25 years later, I never say can't, and I never say try, I just say do. It drives my children crazy when I, they say, all right, we'll try. I say, there's no try, we will do. <laughs> awesome. So from there, you, you went to uh, different states in the US, Canada, West yeah. Europe. Uh, anything else uh, fascinating that you want to share? Well, I really, think that America is an amazingly interesting place. So when I lived in Los Angeles, I would have a lot of people fly into California, go to Anaheim, where Disneyland is, and say, oh, I don't like America. It, mm -hmm. And I would say to them, that is the silliest thing I've ever heard. I was on a Greyhound bus through 26 American states. There is something for everybody in this country. And I found that to be so fascinating as we went from state to state, the different people, the different towns, the different cultures. And I found people to be so friendly, especially in the Southeast, North and South Carolina, Durham, Raleigh, the people were so friendly everywhere we went. Mm -hmm. And so I found it really expanded my impression of what America is and all the choices that we have here. And so then when I went on to Europe and people said things about, oh, you came from America, I'd say to them, you've got to go and travel these states and see all the different people and choices that are available to you. I, I think many Americans haven't had that opportunity. Throughout this uh, travel, two, two more questions on this. One uh -huh. is, uh, you, you, were you still using the money that you initially had or you, you earned some? Yeah. I did not work at all for nine months. I hostled out the money and, you know, staying in Newport hostels was relatively inexpensive. I always looked for experiences that were free. Wherever I went to a town or a city that I did have family, I always went to stay with them and ate their mm -hmm. food and <laughs> enjoyed their hospitality. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, I lived on milk, bread, whatever I could, cans of food. This was not about shopping. This was not about eating expensive food. This was about experience and culture. And I think that's what's different today, traveling as an adult, is that now I want to experience the food and I want to shop in my destination. But when I was in my 20s and I didn't have any money, it wasn't about shopping. It was about the experiences. And I think that's the difference. And overall, throughout this time, the safety, um, you managed that? Yes. I, you know, there were one or two times where I thought, oh, this probably wasn't very smart. Um, but I was extremely fortunate. I never had anything bad happen to me. And uh, just a coincidence that I'm seeing nine months, like a new birth. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I never thought of that before, you know. <laughs> All right, so let's move further. You, you landed your first job and then you started that. And then um, at some point you decided, I want to do my own. Uh, after 9-11, you decided you want to do your own uh, business. So what was that process? Thought you know, process. I'm, I, I'm very decisive. And once I make a decision, I just do it. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. dither. And so once I knew that I wanted to start my own business, I just did it. I walked into my boss's office the next day and I said, I quit. I'm done. And mm -hmm. of course, he said to me, how much money can I offer you to stay? You want 10000 And I said, you don't mm -hmm. understand. It's not about the money. It's about my life. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to work for someone else. 
-hmm. And so I just did it. And I started doing whatever I could to make money. So I was doing tax returns for $300, friends and family, anyone that needed a tax return, $300. And after the first tax season, I was so busy. I was working harder than I ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. Not making a lot of money because I was only charging $300 for a tax return. So over a period of time, I learned this is how you charge for your services. This is how you protect your time. This is how the this is how people will pay for the value that you offer. And so it's a path. And I tell people, you know, the first two or three years that you're in business, you're just figuring it out. There's no right and wrong. Just do it and figure it out because it takes time to kind of create something that is then your dream. Nobody starts with their dream business just like that. Typically, the moment you when you went to that. How, uh, your boss office or the day before you decided uh, typically you spend like weeks months years sometime on that thought right right was that same for you that you've been thinking for some time you know what I think it's something that's always in the back of your mind right I can do this differently I can do this better if it was my business I wouldn't do it this way and so I, I think I think there's always a, a little piece of me that was, I'm going to do this myself one day, um, but I am not the person to spend months and years crafting a business plan, building a website before I do it. I just do it. And then I build the business and I build the website. And so I have a lot of conversations with people every day mm -hmm. who are just putting all these building blocks in the way, you know, first I have to do this, then I have to do this before I can eat. And some of it I think is just a cautious personality type. So I'm a risk taker by nature. So I just do it and then I figure it out because what's the worst thing that could have happened? What's the worst thing that could have happened? I would have failed and mm -hmm. I would have gone to get another job. Okay, I could have done that. And so, you know, I as much as I, speak to so many people every day and I tell them, please don't spend years working on your business plan. Just do it. Right. Um, yet that you have to be a risk taker and, and not have fear of the unknown to jump out and do that. And not everybody's cut out for it. So there are some people who are just not cut out to be business owners and that's okay. It's important to know who you are and what your risk tolerance is. Awesome. This is, <laughs> Like you decided, and then next day you met, and then you started your journey there. You know how I know? If mm -hmm. you go to a restaurant and someone puts a menu in front of you, how long do you take before you make the decision? Me, 10 seconds. I'll have the fish. My husband, oh, I don't know what's best on the menu. What do you recommend? I'm like, oh, my gosh, pick something. And you know what he ends up picking? Cheese sandwich. And that's because we are very different. He is not a risk taker and he is not a decision maker. He likes to think about it and research. And so when people say to me, I'm thinking about starting a business, I say to them, when you go to a restaurant and someone puts a menu in front of you, what do you do? And so that usually tells me whether there's someone who is just going to jump in and go all in or whether they're going to need to research and take their time and think about it. <laughs> That's a great analogy. I take time, <laughs> but I don't do research. <laughs> I just take time because I, sometimes I cannot decide which one. They're all there you cool. go. See? <laughs> so you're a researcher. You need to make your plans before you just jump. And it's really important. No, to know no, that no, happens. no. I don't do research too. No? Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's different. It's different. We were having a conversation um, in one of the podcasts, uh, uh, one of the episodes that your personality and especially mine prior, yeah. like three years ago, um, was different when I'm working. In when I'm in office, I'm so organized. I'm planner. I I, I know everything that is going on. I can have a, a meeting with sixty people, and I can still have the groups identify that who is doing what, right? Right. In those working sessions, so. I'm that kind of person there. But when it comes to my personal initiatives, um, 
three, I'm talking three years. So uh, I was not that organized in thinking process, in risk taking, in, in taking the control or the drive, right? It was two different right. people. Uh, yeah. So I, I was I was taking a Myers Bridge uh, personality check, and uh, that's when I realized that how do I answer these questions? Should I answer when I'm in my office, full time job, or yeah. should I answer it when I'm at home? Um, so I realized I was living three lives: one for my office, second for my personal initiative, uh, my side hustle, and third when I'm with my family and uh, my kids. Interesting. And so did you take three different perspective tests? No, um, I did not. I, I took uh, based on what I'm doing at office, but okay. in the last three years, I went through coaching and multiple other activities. And now right. I, I try my best to blend all three into one person. Okay. Now I'm not acting in front of other people that I'm a senior manager, I'm this, this person. Uh, I act like I act in front of my kids or, uh, right. And, uh, same thing, uh, with this YouTube channel that I started six months ago and I writing, I, I try to be more focused, more on the consistency and then the, uh, and then uh, the, the goal I'm trying to achieve versus, uh, um, limiting to what, who I am and what I can do or not do. So I am. I am delivering based on the out, not the outcome, but the the purpose of this initiative is right. driving everything else. Is is bringing everything in align, alignment. That's fascinating. You know, I never thought about that. That when you take those tests, they're asking you to take it from a perspective, mm -hmm. and it's and it's not all encompassing because we are all different in different parts of our lives. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Um, hmm. Yeah, and, and last thing, um, not related to, but there is another thing. I, many years ago, I started a, a software development company. I had three people working in India. Um, and that was, I had a full-time job, and then I had this initiative. Wow. Um, and uh, I, I left it to that level. I I didn't think to make it so big. Um, I I wanted that to up and running while I'm also enjoying my full time job. So I I never made that uh, transition from the full time job to this because back in the mind I was thinking uh, this <clears throat> this is my passion. This is my hobby. If I convert that into a full time job. I will be after people to earn that minimum six figure that I'm earning in my full time job, right? That's and right. And then, then additional uh, work for my my passion. And I felt like uh, I shouldn't mix the two. I do these for my passion, my my hobby type thing, and enjoy it. A and then my full time is giving me experience and the money. Um, so that was. A wow, you are 24 7. <laughs> I, I was. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So you're doing it all. Yeah, I was doing it all, but now um, now it's different. I'm, I'm single person all over the place. Again, on that one, because this was my initiative, this is a company that I was trying to run. So I have to act wow. as, as, a, a, as a CEO or account manager or something, right? Completely different mindset than um, right. at that point, I was a senior tech lead uh, in my company. So I was more technical there. And right. senior talking to customer, I, I don't want to use any technical terms. So it was, right. my life was so conflicted at that time. Right, and also when you work in corporate America, then you're within this corporate structure where you can't, you're kind of required to behave a certain way and you're required to do certain things and anything different is not really welcome. I mean, they say, oh, bring us, but they don't. They want everyone to kind of work a certain way so that the machine runs. Um, and, and so you, if you can't, it's not easy to be yourself in that environment. Well, yes. And I don't know if it was the requirement in my company or not, but Inside me, that was the perception that I have made that I have to make a perception 
um, yeah. that uh, I'm I'm manager and I'm leader and I have to act certain way. Right. Um, right. And it, that go on for some time, but yeah. uh, and then I was after uh, executive presence. So uh, to be able to go in the ladder, you have to have right. executive presence. And then uh, I felt like uh, my personality at home, very laid back, uh, not laid back in the term, but um, I just like to sit the way I want to sit or talk the way I want to talk. And then uh, this executive presence. So I felt like there's a big mismatch, but fortunately with last three years, now I don't care about all those. I just put who I am and uh, how I act and, uh, and, and I present that. Um, I love it. Good for you. Now, there is a story right there because I think that there are probably a lot of people who could really relate to that, especially doing the kind of corporate technical work that you do. Uh, I think, you know, that's a great story to share with the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's a transition where you change from impressing other people to ex uh, to experience the moment that you want to live. Right. So right. It, it, it's it's a mind uh, mindset shift, or um, yeah, it, it it's an amazing journey. And you're right. Uh, yeah, I, it really is. You know, because you're so focused on what needs to be done every day, but when you're able to take a step back and look and go, wow, look at who I am every day. That's so interesting. All right, let's come back. Okay, let's come thing. back. My partners are here now. I hope the noise isn't too bad. Otherwise we'll have no, to I did not now. even hear. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. Um, so when you started this new company and you said you took almost a year um, where you was taking whatever is coming your charges was not that good uh not that much that <clears throat> so the two questions that i wanted to ask number one what was driving you during this time and what help you had emotionally mentally that was keeping you insane uh right keeping you sane that yeah no, uh, it was it was make money just make money okay. pay the bills because i never had a plan b I didn't have any family here who were gonna help me. If I didn't have the money to pay the rent mm -hmm. or pay for groceries, I was gonna be homeless. So for me, the big driver was make the money to pay the bill. And I didn't really have anybody pushing me or helping me. I was just self-driven to do that. Um, and I still have that today because I don't have a plan and be paid a mortgage, we don't live here. So mm -hmm. I think that's very different than people who start businesses and have a backup plan. I didn't have a backup plan. And there's something about not having a backup plan that makes you hustle. And then the second thing that you said, at some point you, you figure it out that uh, um, how to bill for your services. And uh, um, so what was that process? How yeah, I, you know, I, I think it was a lot of self-education at that point where I would listen to podcasts and read books and go to conferences. And what I started to see was that I was good. Mm -hmm. I was good at what I did. And there were other people in my industry who were charging more than I was and working less. And so it doesn't happen overnight. But slowly yeah. I started to realize my value. And I started to push up my prices and I started to limit the time that I would spend with people mm -hmm. or answering questions or working. And so it was an evolution of, you know, 10, 15 years of learning and finding ways to do things differently and better. Uh, and I think we're all learning because markets are changing, customer needs are changing. And so we all have to change with that. Right. Um, but you have to be willing to change. And so I'm always willing to change. But people who are not willing to change, they're either going to be miserable or they're going to be left behind. You have to mm -hmm. be willing to change. And, and again, take the risk, right? When I said to a customer, no more $300 tax return. It's going to be $1,000 of tax return. I took that risk that they could say no and right. leave. And then I have no business. But that was a risk that 
that I was willing to take because I knew I was worth it. And those are the risks that I've taken every day, every year for the last 11 years. I was about to ask you how many years in this uh, this business and you just answered that question. So 11 years. So, well, been I've been an accountant in the States for 25 years. I got my CPA license 25 years ago. But I, you know, worked at different firms. I started my own business. After about five years, I grew that business so big. I was stressed. I wasn't having any fun. And so I went into partnership with two other people. And okay. we formed a three-person accounting firm. That was terrible. I would never do that again. And but so, that's what I'm assuming you're saying. Yeah. Terrible. After a year of arguing over the coffee machine and what kind of coffee to put in the machine, I was like, oh, I can't stand this. I need to be my own boss. So I left and I decided, what now? What should I do now? So I went back to take a job because I thought, well, I'll go get a nice big salary, you know, and just leave at five o'clock every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after two weeks, I knew that was a mistake. Um, <laughs> and so 11 years ago, I came home from my job and I said to my husband, I quit today. And he was horrified. He said, we're going to be homeless. We're going to lose our house. What are we going to do? Don't worry. We'll be fine. And I ended up buying a small $150,000 CPA practice from two retiring accountants. And I didn't have that kind of money. So what I did was I did a five-year payment plan with them where over five years I paid them out. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the start of my 11-year journey of building this business to seven figures from 150000 um by myself. You did not tell your husband before you quit? Because <laughs> I knew he would talk me out of it. I knew he would be scared and he would, yeah. be, he would want me to suck it up and stay, but I could not. I, I just could not. Um, and so I will never forget that day, standing in the kitchen and the look of horror on his face. Uh, but here we are today, and now he knows never to doubt me. You know, uh, uh, there was a, a episode that I did, and uh, we discussed about one particular item where uh, I made a comment that the best way to kill your dream is to tell your uh, husband or wife. Oh, or that's husband. interesting. <laughs> because uh, uh, in your case, it was slightly different. He probably, I mean, he trusted you for the, right. the skills and all. But many time, and in that case, um, uh, she wanted to open a wine shop. Oh. And she told her husband. And uh, um, so... Um, that's their, the dream was killed. And I was saying that uh, nowadays when I start something new, for example, this uh, podcast, I didn't tell anyone except my 11-year-old. Uh, my ah. brother did not know, my, my parents, my wife, nobody knew. And I just started it. And uh, for months, uh, did not know. Uh, other people did not know. They knew that I'm into something, but I always been into something <laughs> or the other. So right. it, um, exactly. Yeah, so um, a dream squisher. <laughs> so uh, the, the reason behind it could be multiple. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is uh, they try to protect you. Yeah. Try to, yes. right? Um, so they try to protect you either financially or emotionally. That, right. All right. So all that is for good care. But at the same time, our fight is with ourselves. Right. And, uh, um, when our close one say uh, something that our mind is kind of talking us out, then uh, it it just become louder. Our internal right. voice become louder. So I realize when you start something, either find a like-minded people and share with them right. or don't share with anyone. You just yeah. fight with your mind and you will be okay. Right. I'm a big fan of journaling. So I, I journal a lot. I, I keep handwritten journals here in my desk and I journal a lot because I find that for me an outlet of any fears, concerns, frustrations, and then positive feedback of, 
yes, I can, I can do this, I know I can do this, rather than relying on other people who have their own issues, like you say, that they bring to the fore. It's not that they don't want to support you, it's that they're scared for you and they want to protect you from yeah. anything going wrong. And so, yeah, I, uh, I write it all in my journal. Another observation that all the people who have uh, discovered themselves, like not in terms of success, success, they all are successful, but the people who know who they are, uh, they all have done the journaling. Interesting, really. Yeah, it's a common, uh, common uh, uh, habit right. that I get around. Yeah. Wow, because you meet a lot of interesting people. I am, and and uh, I, I try to focus on the journey part, so that's why yeah. I able to extract those um, type of uh, emotions there. Fascinating, fascinating. For eleven years, continuously working and hiring different people, uh, all that. Again, other than money, what was driving you? I guess a sense of self pride. I, I always wanted to. I want to be proud of what I do every day. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to be able to manage my own time. So I like that now I can play golf on a Friday if I want. I can go play tennis on a Monday if I want to. I like knowing that I, I needed to build something that would allow me to have the freedom to take time for myself when I wanted to. This punching a clock from nine to five, and then having someone judge how many hours you do or do not work made me crazy. Mm -hmm. And so my big, my big goals were to make enough money and to have enough people in my organization so that I did not have to be tied to my desk all day, every day. Awesome. In terms of books that I love that were life changing, you know, mm -hmm. um, Profit First by Mike McCallick is absolutely life-changing. I was a profit first professional and Mike McCallowitz was my business coach for a while. That book is absolutely life-changing. Um, Traction by Gina Wickman, all Gino stuff, really life-changing. Um, trying to see what else is on my bookshelf that I love. I'm a prolific reader, and my goal is always to take one thing away from a book. So I don't think every book you read you need to implement or follow their rules, uh -huh. right, or their guidance. No. What I look is for one thing that I can learn from it. And then sometimes I learn nothing, and I, I get halfway, and I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like their tone. Um, there's some books I've read where I just don't like their tone. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of books I read, I just hope to learn one thing from. And I, I certainly found that Profit First is one of the best with um, tools and implementation that you will feel the difference in your life. I'd like to get the, the video clip of your uh, bookshelf too then. Oh, yes, absolutely. I have rows and rows of books now, you know. And, and what's interesting is I love to read on a Kindle. So for pleasure, when I read novels and autobiographies that I read on my Kindle. But business books, I like to actually have the book. Yeah, you can see some of the book here. Yes, you read. do. Some of them are because they had a very good color, so it reflects yeah. really well. And some of them, yeah. I, I read it in Audible, and then I like it so much that I bought the physical copy. Yeah, that's true, too. I've done that, too, where I've read it on Kindle and thought, oh, I want to have that book. <laughs> Yeah, I love good books. And so I think, you know, for those of us who, when you don't have a lot of money to spend, I never had a lot of money to spend on expensive coaches or masterminds or go to conferences. I didn't have that. So books were my way in. And so I think for relatively little money, you can grow your thoughts, you can open your mind, you can leave your office through books. And because I see a lot of people say, oh, I, you know, I want to join a mastermind or I need a business coach. Yeah, it would be nice. I mean, I, you know, I think we could all benefit from those, but by way of dollar for dollar, if you can't afford that, then your next best thing is to read books, listen to podcasts. All right, moving to the last section. What is your goal setting and time management method? 
Oh, I am absolutely very strict on this. So um, my calendar is brightly color coded. I never take client calls on the weekend. And I only, I was just writing an article about this yesterday. I only see clients twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And a lot of my colleagues will say to me, but Wendy, don't you lose customers because you don't, you tell them you can only see them on Tuesdays and Thursdays? And what Mike Michalowicz explained to me that's really stuck with me is if you have a heart problem and you need to go and see the best heart surgeon, do you think he says to you, Wendy, when would you like to come in? No, no, no. He says, I have an appointment on Friday at nine o'clock. Will you be there? And you say, yeah. So when people call me, and they have tax mm -hmm. problems or money problems. And I tell them, I can see you on Tuesday or Thursday. They say yes. And for people who say, oh, I can't. I can only work with you on a Saturday. I go, I'm so sorry. You need to find someone else. Mm -hmm. Because my time is extremely valuable. And not that my client's time is not, but this is my business. It's going to work my way. And so I absolutely believe in time blocking and time management and setting boundaries around your time. So I have two, two cell phones. This one is for work. And then I have a personal one. When I'm not working, I leave the work one in my desk. I, I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> no one's bleeding in my world. Um, and so I also have a team of people who answer the phone and can help clients get what they need. But I definitely think protecting your time is protecting your sanity and clients will respect that. And how do you, or should I ask different questions? Um, who Wendy will be in five to 10 years from now? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I will be Susie Orman, but the newer, updated, more modern version. I want to be able to teach on a larger platform and, and yes. help more people make smart choices. Is there any question that I did not ask, but you want to answer? Um, no, I don't think so. I think you have a wonderful interview style. You know, I, I, yes. I love it. It's such an interesting conversation. You are very different than a lot of other podcast hosts that I've met with. You're very real and very personable. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you for saying that. No, you're welcome. I've enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> it's like chatting with a friend. That's, that's what I try to do. Thank you. Um, do you have a question for me? I don't really. I looked you up and, uh, and you're a fascinating person. Um, and I wish you lots and lots and lots of luck on your journey. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we, we're going to go through the last question. What is your message to the audience? My message to the audience is that you can do whatever you want to do. I truly believe in the American dream. I came here with nothing but a bag of dirty clothes. And you can manage your money and you can learn to find more tax deductions. It's about having the courage and the belief that you can and surrounding yourself with knowledge and always be learning. Thank you so much for your time today. I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you. You're welcome, Dino.